Yeah, it's me. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, you hear it. I'll call this board lessons in to order for Thursday, April 23rd. Uh, this is the virtual meeting, so we'll do the roll call. Um, Eric, that's really present. And Allie, present. Donald Poole, he's present. Donald Poole, present. Thompson. Present. Let's go across from the absent. We also have Andy Doerr, town manager, and Elizabeth Funker, deputy town clerk, to participate in the vote with 15 minutes. So, approval signed treasurer's warrant number 42. So moved. Present. And I second the motion. Eric Gasparini votes yes. Ben Allen? Yes. Dick Thompson? Yes. Uh, Donald Poole? Yes. Okay, approve agenda. I move we approve the agenda as uh, presented. Second. Then I second the motion. Eric Astrain votes yes. Ben Allen? Yes. Dick Thompson? Yes. Donald Poole? Yes. Okay, we'll go right into our budget workshop. Uh, first, we need to Yes, we have not uh, finished the administration uh, department review yet. I think the, the one thing we were waiting on the, on that line was to see if we were going to kind of waiting on prices for the budgetary and kind of bookkeeping software. Uh, correct. Yeah, the budget and transparency piece. So it's the a lot of what we were looking at had um, a lot of them offered two or three different uh, kind of modules or components to their software. Um, you know, what we were trying to do was get to a point where we could have a, a better a better forward face on the budget stuff throughout the year, both in terms of the department review throughout the year, but also for the public if they wanted to see those. Um, in a better way, we could put them up online. Um, you can go so far as to have like an integrated um, kind of dashboard on the website that some have, and that that was a little bit even further priced. Um, so the, the prices in the, in the software we looked at that offered a budget book builder, um, which helps put together this whole thing um, through a program um, rather than multiple Excel you know, books. Um, I'll, and adding all the way up to the insight as well as the public interface piece ranged anywhere from about 9,200 bucks on the low end um, upwards to one of them was 80,000. Um, so that was not even included, but um, it was kind of in that nine to $20,000 range is what the, they were offering for the smaller, uh, smaller communities, smaller packages. Um, I think there was, I, I did, we did do two different um, tutorials or kind of demos with the some of the, with some of the staff that be using it as well, you know, with the companies. Um, the one at the 9200 was is I think already a price that's already gone by. That was if you committed, kind of committed to it before the end of March, um, paid for it in July. Um, that that price has gone already up to 13,000 now. Um, what we're trying to do right now, I guess, is that's what I'm trying to say is I don't think next year we should. We need to consider this if we want to strike it. I am trying. I am still trying to, to upgrade the Sage software, which is our current bookkeeping software, and try and get it set up so that here, some, but I don't appear to have audio. so that some of the so, so we can hear you. Can you hear us? We can keep going. Um, so the Sage, the Sage software that we're using now is just out of date. It still lives on the server. There's a cloud-based option. 
that would give the opportunity for remote access and we could limit it to a view only for department heads. Um, and then Debbie still has the full control of the bookkeeper to do the postings and journal entries and all that kind of stuff. So it's a much cheaper version. It's not a budget book builder, um, but it, it would help enhance our bookkeeping software and access to the numbers for the department heads. Um, and we'll just for next year, not worry about um, trying to integrate the um, kind of those dashboards and some of those more forward facing pieces for next year. We can look at other ways to try and try and do it differently or better. Um, but I think so that's going to run us right now for two different users, full access and view only. I think it's they're, they're quoted us for about a thousand bucks. Um, just over a thousand bucks. Um, and whether we, whether or not we do a second view, I'm still waiting to follow up with them. It won't be anywhere near the 9,200, um, but I'm trying to get Debbie to um, set up a, um, a demo while she's work, when she's working at home one of the days um, so she can kind of learn a little bit more about it just to get comfortable. It, the nice thing is it's the same that we see now, um, but they do offer more insights, more financial management tools, which is stuff that I can use to share with you in the departments and help with the budget buildings that we haven't utilized yet. So there's a little bit of a learning curve there. So we might need a third license potentially. I'd, I'd be comfortable proposing, I mean, cause you see we have the bookkeeping software already in there uh, at 450. So the 1300 is probably closer to two users rather than three. Um, so if you were to authorize, you know, look at it to say, you know, $2,000. Um, so we'd be taking out the 9,200 and taking the 1,300 that's on that page, increasing it to 2,000. I think that would cover for three users if we went to three. Um, and leave us with the ability to, you know, improve what we have. At this time, for this year, yeah. yeah. Um, if you take out the, the 92 and go to 2000 um, for the trio software, the Microsoft office isn't until next year. Um, it should be 8,600. Yeah, that, um, that go, uh, go oh, daddy thing is yeah, Microsoft is through 22. Yeah. So anytime we add a, a new email, so I don't know if we have to add any new ones, but if we do, I mean, it, it, it goes, um, for a three year. And so when we have a three year kind of called a contract subscription, I guess, we'll just add it to that same three year term so that on the third year, it all renews. And so we'll see a big, you know, about that much, maybe a little bit more next on next uh, two years budgets. Um, so just try and track that and put that in there so we can remember that. So on that line, it'd be 8,600. Yeah. I move Adjust the computer software line to eight thousand six hundred dollars. Second. Can I second the motion? Very good question. Hearing none. Eric Gasparini votes yes. Can I? Yes. Bill Carson. Yes. Jake Thompson. Yes. And Donald Poole. Yes. So I don't. I don't know if I have it on the. Lizzie, I don't know if you've seen it. I don't think we've con we've you guys have voted on the total admin budget. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to go through anything else in that in that um, bundle there. I think we were pretty comfortable with it already, weren't we? Yeah, except yeah. that last item. Yeah, I agree. So we go in with three twenty one six ten. Is that what we're doing now? Yeah, three twenty one six fifteen. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I move the administration budget at $321,000, $621,600. Yeah, the agenda was just for budget. Second. Seconded by Donald Poole. Is that Donald? Is that you, Donald? Yes, that was me. Okay. Any more discussion? 
Mary Nunn, Eric Ashburn, votes yes. Yeah. Ken Allen? Yes. Bill Crossman? Yes. Dave Thompson? Yes. Ronald Poole? Yes. Washington School. What were we waiting for here, Andy? Was it about repairs? Is that what we were waiting for? Uh, it might have been. I mean, we certainly have some some things to talk about in terms of repairs. Um, I've, I've reached out to another contractor to try and do some of the, the siding work and, and replace some of the, um, the boards behind the siding. So I mentioned last year, earlier this year, that you know there's, a, there's some of the siding out here is, is rotting. Um, you can put your fingers through a couple spots. Um, you know, we did do, um, this past weekend, had someone come in. Um, Charlie came in and did a pest control application for ants. Um, it's been having a lot of ants upstairs and in this room. So on this northern wall, um, they were here last year as well, uh, about this time. So um, had him treat for that, and I think some, you know, some of some of the concern now, you know, being not knowing what's behind the walls when you get into the you know the clapboards and start pulling that out. Um, so we have money in this year's budget to do some of that that we we're going to do with painting. So we'll put the push off the painting probably this fiscal year, um, and there's some money in the budget um, in this department, you know, for the building um, to to do some painting next year, uh, whether we wanted to increase it or not. You know, last year when we had someone look at the price or look at it to give us a quote, um, which they're not able to do this spring, uh, they would give us like an hourly rate. There's a lot of just touch up paint. Um, we had to, we're having to paint, paint the clad boards new. Uh, it's obviously gonna use a little bit more, it costs a little bit more, so. Um, I think I remember why. I mean, the heat pump thing didn't. Um, Lucy McCarthy wanted to do some more, or someone wanted to do some more um, investigation before they, the budget committee gave their recommendation. Isn't that why we put this one off? Uh, yeah. They, so yes, and that uh, that might have been another reason. Then they did. So there was two quotes for the heat pumps. One. One that would get an option that would do more on the cooling side that could supplement some of the kind of shoulder season heating, um, but it wouldn't be. And then the other quote was for a system that could could someday replace the heating system that's in here now if it needed to. Um, and there was a big difference in price between those two. Um, it's in there on that page. The first option was for thirteen thousand six hundred, uh, and the other quote, which was the you know again a system big enough to replace what we have, if you know should we need to, was thirty four thousand six hundred. Now there's no reason to believe that. Um, you know, the quote was free, but there's no reason to think that the boy, the system that we have in the building is anywhere near um, or in a condition that's not going to last for another 10 or 15 years. Um, it gets serviced every year. Um, it doesn't work all that terribly hard. So the committee felt comfortable after Margaret talked with Niall um, on the, the smaller quote to offer the, the cooling as a primary you know, reason. And it would it would take care of the, the downstairs office and the second floor office, just the west side of the building, um, you know. And didn't see the need. The budget committee and I would agree don't see the need to. And now knowing what I know, to go for a bigger system. So also on that page, when it talks about improvements, there is a little bit of the forty five hundred to do exterior painting. Um, that certainly be enough for the touch up painting. I don't know if you'd get too. You know, two sides of the building or the lower portions and touch up, but um, there's 4,500 in, in there to help go towards painting. And then also on the um, the wage page, wages page on there towards the beginning of that section, um, put in a, a line for building maintenance as if it was to be a, you know paid out as an employee, but it could also just be as a service fee if we don't hire as an employee. Um, certainly there'd be you know, some liability and some concern depending on what type of work's being done. But um, some of this kind of goes to the multiple buildings we have and the, con you know, the continuous maintenance needs that don't get addressed on a proactive basis. You know, basically, oh, something has broken or we know we know this is a problem now. Um, and it was just part of a discussion. Do you want to, we've talked about it a couple of times throughout the year and over the past couple of years, you know, is there a desire to look for that to be an in-house position. So you have someone you know you can call and take care of any of the buildings or with what we have now, it depends on the building who might do the work. 
Um, sometimes it's harder to, to be able to get a contractor on a, on short notice. Uh, in the past, we've sometimes had problem ch a challenge with having um, some that are insured, have the workers comp or have the paperwork that's required now. Um, so we do our best to work with the on-island stuff always. And there's, there's at least one or two that we know we can call. Um, there's more that have been called um, to do work at times in the past. So we try and work with them when we can, but um, you know, just kind of an open for a conversation if you wanted to explore um, the possibility of it being kind of like a, a step more of a staff person rather than a, and not something like a permanent, you know, you know, guaranteed hour more as an as needed, you know, kind of like a temporary intermittent kind of work kind of thing. I don't know how you feel about that possibility of that. I think it's a nice idea, but unfortunately I'm feeling a little doom and gloom about the current economy, you know, the future economy short term. So, you know, I, I understand we have some work to do, but if, if, if we can keep this as cheap as possible, I think right now, I think it's the year to do it. I'm pretty concerned about what this summer is probably going to bring. Yeah, and I don't know what the what the rates are, hourly rates are, you know, if you go out, you know, on a private contractor base, you know, as a service provider, you know, for the general construction stuff, it's all it depends, you know, the company you have and who's doing it as to what that range is. So that was the other other part of that is, you know, the dollar amount that's in there is one thing, whether it's at a wage, you know, employee or whether it's a, a service contractor, um, certainly the, the price would probably be different, um, the hourly rate. And so the money will go a little bit further one way and less the other, but you don't have the liability and the overhead to buy all the equipment or, you know, take on the, the other concerns that might come with that. So I think either way you need to, you should probably look to carry that an amount close to that, not knowing what we might find, um, you know, in the spring, if we can get someone to get to it and, and work on the start working like clapboards. I do think that maybe we should at least buy some of the materials we might need to replace clapboards this fiscal year, even if we can't get someone to actually fix them before July 1st. That way we've we've been able to at least use some of this year's budget to work towards it because I don't think you're going to be able to buy clad boards and pay for the labor with six thousand. Yeah. Um, so at least we'd be able to split some of that cost over the two years, and two fiscal years. Yeah, that six thousand dollars, you know, for you know, start building next year, and you know, in the future, I think it would be wise to talk about it more. You know, more of the position designed for not just this building maintenance, but I would say all of our building. I agree. Yeah. We're going to make some pretty major investments in town property here in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. So it'll be important to stay on top of maintenance. So, if, I don't know if you want to. Just for the sake of the budget to be clear, you know, where the intention is, you know, if you you want to see that six thousand, roughly go over to the improvement tab, you know, kind of under the improvements line. I think that, would, that seems reasonable to me to put it into the improvements line, and that way we can spend that money both on material and labor. Okay, so that would make if you just take the 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 painting at forty five and the six thousand, that would go towards general, you know, uh, maintenance on the clapboard replacement, and then we do still have some slate uh, roofing tiles that need to be fixed that we still haven't found a contractor to come do. I've talked to, I think, at least three now in the last two years. Um, all said they'd come back and I haven't heard from, from them yet. So um, there's only one that I know that still comes back and forth. Um, so I, that is still also on our list. There's only a couple that right now that I know of. Um, they do take in a little bit of water in some places. So if, if you had brought the six over, um, that would make it uh, 25,600 for that line. It's not increasing the total budget that was presented, but. 25,000. Yeah. And that's on the improvement line. And that would knock the wages line down to the. 13,860. 13, yeah. So I move we approve the wages line on the Washington School for, what was that number again? 13. The 64,365. Sorry, one more time. The total? Yeah, the total for wages. Oh, total for the wages would be 13,860. 13,860, and the total for improvements would be 25,600. Correct. Okay, yeah. I move we approve the wages line at $13,860 and the improvements line at $25,600.
Second. Pam Alley seconds the motion. Any discussion? We have still one move. We're not going to be able to vote on that. All right, Gary Gasparini votes yes. Pam Alley? Yes. Bill Crossman? Yes. Dave Thompson? Yes. Donald Poole? Yes. And the most important five years. All right. So the next one I have that we haven't, you guys haven't gone through. Wait, we didn't, did we, that was just to change those two lines. Yeah. We still have to vote on the total. You the total. You're right there, sorry. So the total though remains unchanged from the department recommendation of 64, 365, correct? Correct. I move, I move we approve the Washington School budget at $64,365. Is that right? Second. Second. Any more seconds? Pam, do you want to clarifying question? Yeah, I, I didn't we drop the, uh, the improvement to 25600 Oh, oh, okay. We decreased the wages line. Oh, okay. We just moved. It's just to capture the intention of where you where you expect it within that department to spend it. I missed, yeah, I missed. Uh, so on, on that particular department, if you will, that's almost a 50% 50, 50 increase on that particular. So it goes from this year, it's at 43,000 and next year it'd be 64. Of that, you know, about, most of that increase is going to be the heat pumps at 13.6 plus the the extra the extra maintenance costs that we're looking at trying to do. So okay. hopefully there are one year, maybe you know some of the maintenance might be to us another year after that, but you know maybe not. Right. So it, yeah. right, and so I think it's like for the heat pumps, you could look to take that out of your fund balance, and so it's not a tax impact um, in that sense. And I think even some of those improvements you could even look to do out of fund balance, so it wouldn't be a tax rate impact. Okay. Um, so Yes. Yes, I'm here. I vote yes. I believe the next one I have is going down the line in order. There's the uh, capital projects reserve funds. That's what I have. Is I don't think you guys have looked at this one um, at all yet. Okay. I mean, some of them are going to be this, you know, the what you've been funding um, for the for some of the reserve funds that are specific. The other um, one that's in there that's not a, a a reserve fund; it's used more as an operating line, which is the road repair. Um, you know, and that one does show an increase on that. Um, I think I'll explain that. So the first one on there is the fire department reserve for the you know trucks, equipment, um, and training. Uh, so to fund that at 25,000 as we have uh, for the past few years. Um, the road repair line um, up 90,000, um, up from 100,000. Um, so the, the increase there, I, there are there is an increase there um, recognizing the so the cold patch was something that was in the public works operating budget. Um, I just 
not, it's not, you know, just put this in, in the road repair line, thinking it's more, more aligned with road repair if you're buying cold patch um, to try and group these, these things together so it's easier to track. Um, calcium chloride as well is something that's been on the operating budget for public works. And again, another road repair item. Um, so just grouping that there. Um, so some of that increase is included in that. Um, the other things that are different on there is we, there's guardrail replacements that we have to do. Um, we were talking about doing an inventory and that's still in the works. Um, need to get measurements, you know, the price depending on the guardrail material that we put in. Um, and then the added cost of the, trans the, the transportation and lodging. Um, I think the, just the straight linear foot price is anywhere from 35 to about 50 or 60 bucks a foot, um, depending on the material we're using from what we could find. And then you've, again, you've got the transportation and, and lodging on top of that. Um, so we just need to go down through and look at what guardrails are installed and in what condition exactly and should need to be replaced. We've got sections that should have guardrails in that never have. And then you got the in-between where there's the granite blocks um, that were put in decades ago, um, you know, that either aren't adequate anymore or, or need to be looked at to be replaced with a, a standard guardrail. Um, so proposing that we look to spend about 50,000 on guardrail installation work next year uh, to try and start chipping away at that. I'd get us, I mean, that number there would get us what a thousand feet roughly. And that, that can go pretty quick. We got, we got, I think one section I think coming down from the turbine, the wind towers, I think if you go both sides of the road there where, where they are, I think it's a thousand feet. Or I mean, you can kind of pick off where a thousand feet is um, and, and see it go kind of quick. You know, but we do need to start working on, I think you should start working on replacing some of these. I think so, yeah. And then we got the, you know, the Granite Island Bridge is another one where I think both sides of that road, if you were to add it up, I think is about a thousand feet as well. Um, from where you need to terminate each each end. Right. <laughs> um, so that's a big one. The um, there's there's about seventy five thousand estimated for the gravel road surface maintenance. You know, and that that's the calcium chloride, which we can get a truckload of calcium chloride for about ten grand. That gets us enough for two treatments on the roads. The way we've been able to put it out the last few couple of years. Um, and then the rest of that would kind of be earmarked for gravel surface material. Um, you know, textbook says you lose at least an inch a year, even with best management practices through plowing and dust and, and that kind of thing. Um, so recognizing that it's a far cry from what you would do to put an inch on all the roads and granted, they probably don't all need an inch, but at some point, if you never put new material down, you're going to be adding four to six inches at some point, um, or you'll be grading the, the, the base of the road. Uh, which is a bigger issue. Um, yeah, so that is a kind of a bigger increase um, to try and, you know, to look at. Um, let's see. Roadside trimming is something we've talked about in the past. And, you know, that could potentially be um, set up as like a rotation, if you will, that there's a company that gave us an estimate a couple of years ago that kind of had the attachment on the excavator, you know, and they'd be able to come out and just work, work on clearing back the right of ways. Um, you see like the electric company will do it with the power lines, we, we would do it with the sides of the road, to, you know, for multiple reasons, of course, is, you know, helping the sun get in in the wintertime to melt the ice off, the snow off, um, you know, keep things pushed back, you know, trucks sometimes are calling and letting us know that they're hitting the, the trees and the brush coming in, helps for drainage and keeping the road, the road's edge and shoulder in a good condition. Um, the guy that does the roadside mowing, you know, isn't going to be taken down with his, with his sickle bar there, the the trees and the in the brush that's bigger than a few a few inches in diameter so um this would go a little bit beyond but once they use a piece of equipment like this presumably it'd be quite a few years before trees would come back at a point where they're in the road or too big that the sickle bar couldn't handle it um so it's not something you'd have to do probably every year maybe for a couple of years well so 10,000 of this just came from a different department so yeah this one shows up ninety thousand dollars but really it's only up eighty thousand dollars because you are just taking money from somewhere else that we normally spend, correct? Uh twenty thousand is brought in from the 20, from the public works because those the cold patch and the calcium chloride was under as operating expenses. Uh, whereas this is all capturing the road repair costs that we have. So technically that's seventy thousand. Right. Okay. And you know, the board has been discussing this 
the need for paving, but before we do any paving, we feel like all the water is more to do as much maintenance work as possible, you know, to make sure we have a good surface and good ditching and, you know, trees are out of the shoulder. You know, it's just, it's more expensive short term, but hopefully long term can save the town some money. So the next time there is a paving project, you know, the road will last longer. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, the big thing with the roads is, you know, in like one of the workshops um, in the gentleman from all states that came out and talked to the department, you know, is you got to keep your good roads good. You've seen that road curve where you get the fresh pavement and it's at the best condition it's going to be right. And after about four or five years, you start to see a few things in the cracks in the surface that you could do crack sealing with and, and push that push that curve out that maintenance curve out further. And then you kind of hit year seven or eight and things usually start to go downhill a little quicker. And then you start getting close to needing to do the, um, you know, if you can keep it in a, let's do an overlay coat, that's your, that's your cheapest option. But once you get too far down that slope and you're in the year eight, 10, 12, you know, good chance that any road you've got, you're going to be looking at potentially a reclaim and God forbid a reconstruction. So, you know, when you're thinking longer term, so the ones that just got done, you know, we can work on trying to keep those pushing out and, and keep them in a good in a kind of a good category so it just pushes that that long that hard, that more higher cost maintenance out or reconstruction out you know but we certainly have roads out here that are borderline reconstruction um you know and that it doesn't necessarily matter whether you reconstruct this year or next it still needs to be reconstructed so you know that that being said you don't what you don't want to do is let the ones that are still in a condition that can take an overlay and let them get to that point so some of this work, like Eric said, that ditching, that culvert replacement is in recognition of those ones that need to be probably reclaimed or rebuilt. Um, so we can start chipping away at those um, in preparation for, for one of those projects. And, you know, I'm thinking like um, the North Haven Road uh, beyond the turbines is in that kind of in that condition. Um, parts of the Calderwood Neck Road are getting to be in that condition. And the majority around the Island Road is in that condition. Um, you know, so those ones, I think, are some of the ones that we wanted to focus on, on the for paved roads to do the culverts and the ditching work. And some of that tree clearing and there are there are a couple gravel roads that need more ditching than others um i think the work that, that's happened on zeke's point in the last couple of years is a good example of a lot of money went into it that hill held this year through all the rain and soft winter we had thank goodness other parts not so well other gravel roads have held up really well with the calcium chloride treatments you know we think that that really does make a big difference um in keeping that surface harder mm -hmm. and keeping the material there um so i think that those have been good things but if you don't have the good ditching you know, you're yeah. going to lose those shoulders in the base, so. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on this one? Nope. I'm going to approve uh, $190,000. You want to do that for all of them or just kind oh. of go through them all first? Oh, let's just go, yeah, you're right. Let's go through them. We don't need that. As okay. long as there's no disagreement on that one. You guys on the phone hear that okay and have any questions on that? I'm okay. What was it? What was that? What was the last thing Eric said? I couldn't quite hear it. Oh, I made a motion to approve that number at one hundred ninety thousand dollars, but I will draw the motion and as long as there's no discussion on that particular line, you know, we can just go on to the next slide. So the explanation we just went through was that's the majority of the increase from last year's budget, right? Right. Okay. I, I'm I'm fine. All right, uh, the next one's the uh, ambulance or public works, sorry, the public works reserve. So that's the one we set up uh, last year or a couple years ago now for just vehicle and equipment replacements. Um, like this current year, some of that money was used to help offset the hot box. So it wasn't all out of taxation this year. Um, I did try and put on that sheet um, <clears throat> some of the bigger pieces of equipment that we know we need to look to replace in the next few years. Um, the backhoe is one that the department is, is raised. We've spent a lot of money on repairs on that this year. Um, it's getting at a point where it's still, um, still in, in good condition, but not holding up as well as it should for everyday use. That, that thing really is used about every day. Um, you know, so there's discussion on that, and, you know, and with the salt sand shed going up at the new location, there'd be a need for a loader. So one of the, the, the conversations we've had is to shift the, the, the dump backhoe potentially to 
the new the salt sand shed where it gets even less use. Um, the one that the public works uses every day on the road, running you know five, six, eight hours a day with it to go to the dump where it's going to get used for an hour a day on average, probably maybe you know in that neighborhood. So presumably the the bills we've seen on it have been not engine issues. It's been you know parts in in um, the framing stuff that's been replaced. So it's not something that hopefully should be continuing to be a problem in that sense. Um, but it's still, you know, some of the stuff that's happening to it does does lend to the wear and tear when you're looking for six to eight hours of work almost every day, you know, it's starting to, and when you're without it. So it'll give us another reliable kind of backup, you know, whereas the dump one to go out on the road sometimes isn't adequate. Um, well, there's certainly a record, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, Carl, they've been tracking that for years. And so I have in one of those columns, the estimated average annual, you know, so that, um, sorry, that line is, is looking at, sorry, not on the maintenance, that line's looking at um, the cost of those pieces of equipment with what we think it is for new and what we would have to put in annually into this reserve line if we were to pay for it all in cash. I started saying that thinking that was the maintenance, but in the public works um, department, I did look at what the maintenance was for each each of what we have for the last three and a half years. Um, look here. Let me just pull it up on the spreadsheet. That was a question the budget committee had was, well, what are we spending each year? And it's like the backhoe, for example, what are we spending on average each year for that? Um, I think most of them range anywhere on the low end to like 35 to 4,000 a year, upwards uh, 12 or 12 to 15,000 a year, depending on the piece of equipment. Uh, load. I mean, relative to like an excavator, which is what you would have used to dig with before the backhoe came out, right? Just generally, you know, it was built in a way that is allowed to transport down a road. It was geared differently and it's, it's built more for that. It's not built to be used as your highway transport vehicle, but on this island to transport between job sites, certainly it's what it's built for. You don't have the trailer and, and move and all that. That's just very generally, you know, what it, an advantage that it allows. The disadvantage, of course, is when we talk about digging ditches, placing culverts, is the functionality of, of the backhoe versus an excavator. You lose a lot of it by using just the backhoe because you don't have the reach, you don't have the swing, you know, you got to set up and, and move a lot more frequently than you would an excavator that can walk along. Um, you know, generally for what we've been doing, the backhoe works well. And we're getting into the pro position now where we're needing to ditch a lot. Um, I don't have a number on the miles of ditches we have, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at 15 to 20 miles worth of ditch lines, if not more. Um, you know, and that takes a lot of time to walk along um, you know, with a backhoe. And I think you can go about 20, maybe 30 feet before you have to move to the next section, you know, set up again, right? So it's just a little bit slower. It can be done, certainly. It's a little bit different, but it certainly can be done. Um, so I, I do have, um, for the last about what, three and a half years, the greater on that average, those, that, that span has been 10,500 on average. Of course, some of that was most of that was pretty, you know, very proactive maintenance. We did the a lot of rewiring, replacing harnesses, um, a lot of seals were redone. That was all proactively done work. That otherwise it was in the ballpark of probably four or five thousand a year on average. You know, so that one's a little bit high. The the older dump truck, the two thousand one, um, over that span um, is about ninety six hundred a year. Um, of course, part of that would include the dump um, the the dump body replacement that we did. I think that was about 10 grand. Um, so that's another one that over that over that period of time looks slightly higher. 
Um, the backhoe, um, almost 13,000 over that period of time. Um, it doesn't include all of this year's repairs, uh, obviously. Um, so again, over that period of time, it looks like it's, it's had a lot more. Um, the rest of the vehicles, the, the pickup truck, the small dump and the, and the newest dump truck are <clears throat> anywhere from 6,400 to 7,000. Um, so those ones are a lot more manageable, reasonable, what you might expect for every year um, pieces. So um, just to give you an idea where we're at with the annual average um, repair bills for some of those, you know, $12,000 a year. I mean, you can cut out some of that for the backhoe. You know, so if you were to cut, maybe cut that closer to half or 8,000, um, you're looking at six, six to four, that four to six thousand dollars more now because of, just because it's a little bit older. You know, maybe some of it goes to use, um, you know, but certainly the age is a piece, a factor in that. I think it's got about five thousand hours on it, um, so it has more hours now than the other backhoe we had before we traded it in. Um, so just getting used more. Remember the the gravel road projects we did on, on Calderwood Neck and, and um, Crockett River Road, a lot more hours on that than the other one had just based on some of the work we've been doing. Um, you know, I think it was on average, you start to get into the seven, 7,500 hour range and that's where your, your motors and your engines kind of start to generally start to see some of that depending on how it's used. Um, you know, so we got another year uh, probably before we're in that. We do still need to figure out, um, you know, how we're going to load the trucks next winter with just the two, right. whether we change how we clean Main Street, you know, and not use a backhoe all the time on Main Street and keep that up there to load the trucks when they come in or take the dump one during those storms and bring that down and then coordinate with them to, to swap out the trailers because that their biggest need in the wintertime really is swapping out trailers and, and compressing some of those loads. Uh, maybe moving the burn pile, but it's not necessarily, it's definitely not an everyday, all day kind of need, you know, so that might just take the need to coordinate if we don't end up with uh, another one for next year. So. Um, and that one there, again, if you were to look at that replacement cycle, if, if that's the estimated replacement cycle for each of those pieces of equipment, and that's the estimated cost um, for each of those, you're looking at, um, what would that be, 12, 20, 26, 36, about $56,000 a year that you'd be putting in um, roughly to be able to meet all of those, those estimated replacement years. Um, just to give you an idea of where we're at now. Right, uh, they got about $100,000 not counting what we took out of it this year for the hot box, I think it was about 15, 15 or 20. Um, you know, so you got about 90,000 in there right now. So it's, it's, it's healthy. Um, so that's something to think about in terms of when we need to replace equipment, bigger pieces of equipment, we've got now this ability to, you know, this kind of this cushion there for the emergency things that come up or you know, helped out with the hot box this year. So the tax impact wasn't fully um, covering that. The um, the next one's the ambulance reserve, um, specifically the um, vehicle and equipment reserve, where we just purchased that used ambulance and those two pieces of equipment, the life pack and the cot that came with it. Um, again, the life pack and cot was looking to be replaced anyways. The ambulance that we had within the next three years, you know, we were able to get all three of those pieces and and more. Um, in a fully stocked ambulance for what it was going to cost us for a brand new life pack and a brand new cot. Um, you know, so we're, we're just about. So I think that was a good deal. We got 10 years newer on the ambulance um, and we did it about two years sooner than we thought we would. So it's in a good position. We don't necessarily need to, but, you know, because of it, our, your, your reserve did take a pretty good chunk of that. There was no, no tax impact on that one on a tax base. So that was just using the reserve funds and a good example of why, what reserve funds can do for you when the right, when something like that comes along. So I don't know if you want to consider that or not. And I, I threw it on there to think about just for you guys to consider that, but um, you know, it is in a good place. Uh, we were fortunate enough to this, this week, we did get a $20,000 donation um, to go towards this line. Oh. Um, so, We'll share that with the next regular meeting, you know, when you guys approve the appropriation of that, but that was a very 
nice uh, donation from a family um, out here. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, the police cruiser reserve, that's one I know they had some discussion last year. Um, it raises some discussion, of course, every time it comes up to be talked about. We started a couple of years ago putting money in, so we got about 20,000, about uh, 15,000 in there right now. Um, I, I believe when they, in the town, when you guys bought that last, I think it was like 35,000 roughly to get the, to get the, the cruiser and the, get it outfitted. Um, you know, the, the conversation about, you know, with the county about do we, don't we, you know, you know, what's on the county's plate, that's all part of the contract and worth talking about, but we do have a little bit in there now. If you don't want to fund more for next year, given what, you know, all the other expense increases, that was one I thought maybe with what we have, it'd be okay if we didn't do it this coming year. I don't, I don't see how it's amazing. No, I mean, we, we already have $15,000 in right. that line. That's a pretty nice start. Right. Yeah. You know. Okay, um, perfect. So then uh, the next proposed one's the, um, the equipment reserve. Um, so that's one that we fund about $2,500 a year that can go towards the, the computers, the, the, the server. This year we've had to use a fair amount with the Windows 7 um, obsolescence. Um, we still do need to purchase a couple, you know, some of those, but and we also had to, we planned on buying a couple others out of that this year. So that took a, uh, an additional hit that we weren't necessarily expecting with the Windows 7 um, phase out. So um, I do think you should put the 2,500 in there as we have for the, for the last few years, just to make sure that that stays there. So, I mean, the server at any time could go or a computer could go. I think we're in a pretty good place generally with the computers once we get those Windows 7 ones replaced. Um, I think we'll have done probably close to 10 in the last two, two or three years. Um, you know, hopefully we're doing it so they aren't all coming, coming ripe in the same year. We can just kind of phase them and then what we're putting in here would help cover that. All right. Um, the roads capital reserve, that one there, as you remember, is set up for mostly um, whatever is received from the state for funding. So for every mile of state aid road, we have, they give us a certain amount of money um, to do towards capital maintenance at 35,000 a year. It doesn't go very far for paving. So we just take it and put it in the reserve every year and, and add to it. Um, last, this, this current year, um, sorry, two years ago, you might recall, we had a, a debt service payment on a road, on a paving project mature. We, were, we just shifted that debt service payment to this reserve and increased that funding amount. Um, well, Next year, we're gonna have a debt service payment for the last paving project. So we're shifting in that back to the debt service payment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's not an increase that way. So um, we'll continue to take the roads money that comes from the state and put that towards that. Um, the balance on that's about $500,000 right now. Um, what we've talked about before is a lot of that potentially being used to leverage grant funding for the Main Street project. Um, you know, so if that's how that is to be used, that's, that's a good commitment to help match and make it more shovel ready for us. Mm -hmm. um, so to fund that one at the 30, it's about 35,000 that comes in. We don't know for sure until it gets here, but I don't know if you want to consider putting extra in there or just take what the state gives us and as we have in the past. I think you know, we have to put the bags in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think that's going to be Sure. Um, historic sites is the next one that has a proposed amount. Um, that's one there that we've got a list of historic sites on the island, whether it's the Gallimander, the Eagle in the parking lot, the General Wool Monument, um, the Civil War Memorial. Um, also, we got the water fountains and the bandstand is what we have listed. Um, there's probably more. Um, we don't have a, you know, a work plan, if you will, to address any one of those in particular. We do have the study from the Gallimander. Um, that Molly did last year now that kind of does lay out some of those next steps there are, there is still some I think question as to whether or not the town wants to see uh, uh, a, re, a, a reconstruction um, you know of that piece or a preservation of that piece where you take that and put it somewhere to preserve what is the most original oldest piece and preserve that what's left of it and put some sort of replica in its place in that location we certainly we still need to figure out just what you want to do. 
And I, I only bring it up because with what we have in the reserve and what we put in each year, there's going to be a far cry from what would be needed to do a full on restoration and uh, you know, rebuild of that thing you know, to scale. Um, you know, so that's just just saying that. So 10,000 is what we've been putting in the last couple of years. Um, certainly helps. But again, there's no kind of work plan developed for any of those yet. If we want to work on that this coming year, we you know, probably should. I don't yeah. think the bandstand needs a little bit of work. That uh, the fence at the uh, monument definitely needs to be fixed. That I would put that, you know, up there. I haven't heard where the you know that was the the lions were kind of West was coordinating that through the lions to have in working with Chris Golovsky, I believe, on the the restoration of that fence. He was trying to cast and weld in the the cast iron. Um, pieces and so I don't know. I haven't heard. Haven't been to a meeting in the last few months, so I don't know where they are with an update on that. But I can reach out and find out. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's certainly the general rule. Let's yeah. take that right off the list. Yeah. So do you want to keep that funded at ten thousand again? Well, till we have a, a better work plan and. Yeah. I mean, some of the stuff potentially could be fundraised. Um, you know, the Gallimander, what we talked about, there's a possibility of some fundraising to do the Gallimander work, but um, don't want to shortchange the funding of it either. So, of the of this reserve. Well, another ten thousand dollars for that plant balance. That's a little over forty thousand dollars. Yeah, I'm pretty cheap. Phil, you've talked pretty passionately about the Gallimander the last year or two years. Do you have any thoughts or questions on that? I just want to make sure that the appropriated amount isn't diminished. That's all. Okay. How do you, uh, how do you feel about leaving that amount ten thousand dollars? I'm okay with that. Uh, Phil, what do you think? Phil. Eric, are you talking to me? Yeah, um, are you okay with ten thousand dollars for? Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Okay. All right. The landfill equipment. The next page um, is the next one that's proposed to be funded. So, uh, let's see. in the last few years, they, there had been created the compactor reserve within the landfill for replacement, which we used um, for the compactor that was bought for the recycling. There was also an equipment repair or equipment reserve line within the landfill. Um, you know, so just, I don't know why we have both. The suggestion has been in the last couple of years to just see those as one is equipment. Um, and so funding the equipment reserve line, we do still need to replace the compactor, the single stream, or sorry, the solid waste compactor. That is about 15 years old now, um, still functions. Um, well, it has great compaction still, um, but it certainly is one that we know doesn't owe us anything at this point. Um, the one that we got for the single stream recyclables is a little bit different. Um, we need a bigger one, um, but I think that was all in about 40 grand um, by the time we got the electrical hooked up and the pad poured and all of that. So just as a comparison, so we do have um, about 50,000 right now in that, in that reserve. So the I think the extra if we do 15 this year that should be plenty to get the pad get the new get in what we don't have and should consider as like a, a hopper cover like we do for the recycling now to keep the water out um you know it might help cut down on the blowing around of some of the waste um but also the kind of the curveball if, if we look at the transfer station layout won't be for this coming year but it'll be for next you know two years budgets probably at this point um to consider changing the layout potentially um, you know, trying to factor that into there. So you'd be positioned well to be able to either purchase it on the, on the fly if it fails all of a sudden, or, you know, have it, you know, as part of a, the plan project and wait till then if it can. Yeah. Well, it was certainly started before me, but you guys have continued to, to fund it, so that's certainly helpful. Puts the town in a yeah much better you know fiscal position to do that. I'm fine with the fifteen thousand uh, dollars. Let's see, old fire hall. Um, 
what we get in revenue, you know, for the rental, you know, basically covers the expenses and puts about, you know, anywhere from three, about $3,000 to the good. Um, you know, so I think we had talked about if we get, if we get the excess, everything's paid in that year. If we get the excess, that potentially just goes to a reserve if appropriated to, to this reserve. Um, but otherwise there's um, only about 10,000 in there. And we got the estimate last year on painting the whole building. Um, you know, discussion aside as to whether it would cost that much or could be cheaper is a whole nother thing. But, you know, that's a minimum. You know, there's going to be other maintenance needs on that building. It's in a tough spot. You know, there's potential, there's water still going underneath it at the high tide. So um, it's a line that you probably don't, you know, we don't know that it's about 80. Phil was on that one last. I think it was about, was it about 80 or 90,000 that was put into it a few years ago? About 140. 140. Um, Hopefully that lasts quite a while, but certainly already we know there's painting and there's other things that come up. Um, so it's one of the, one of those ones you can decide if you want this year to be able to put a little more in there. There is a cushion in there already. Um, it's just kind of those unexpected unknowns. Those projects can add up fast depending on what happens. So that's that might be one there that you can look at and say, do we want to wait another year before we put that amount in there? Um, you know, or choose to do it this year. Didn't uh, didn't we get an estimate from Noah Hall for touching up rather than painting the whole building? Uh, what he he gave us a, a quote for the whole building. We approved or the board approved uh, not to exceed a certain amount this year. I think it was like roughly thirty five hundred, maybe off the top of my head. Um, so I, and I have contacted him. He's not prepared to be able to come out this spring with you know everything that's going on on that end. Um, you know, so I haven't been able to find anyone yet. I haven't reached out to anyone yet to still try and do it this spring, but we'll certainly try. Okay, so I propose that we eliminate five thousand dollars. Yeah, that's fine with me. Is anyone else have any thoughts? Okay, uh, let's see. The next one would be the sidewalk repair. I got that right. Mm -hmm. That one there is another one. Um, certainly there's no shortage of work that can be done. Um, having a, a work plan to do that's a whole nother thing. Um, you know, if you might recall the the estimate you guys got, the town got a few couple of years ago to go from that fisherman's friend crosswalk there by the boat yard down to the ferry boat, I think came in at like two, 275 was the low bid just for that section. So, you know, even though there's 400,000 in there right now, it certainly goes fast. And that's another one there that if you pair that with the 500,000 for the road line up for the state aid roads only, um, and pair it with that for the sidewalk reserve line. Now you're talking, you've got a million bucks that could be used as a match to the main street project and potentially we wouldn't might not need any more if we're successful in the grants that we've been keeping our eyes out for and applying for um so it's a, it's a it is a you know best case scenario um but that'd be a project you'd be able to use the reserve funds to pay for in total potentially um but then of course it does eat everything you have and you know and so this is one that's important to keep funding and to do the 50 grand a year i mean you're probably i don't know what that if you did that every year what that replacement cycle would be um it'd probably be 10 years um to get all of them um by the time you look at drainage and curbing and all the stuff because some places you don't have the four feet width that the ada would require for new sidewalks um some places you probably got but maybe two or three feet tops um, so we'd have to do some serious adjustment in a couple sections, probably to be able to comply with ADA. So some like I'm thinking over High Street, for example, there's a couple spots there where it gets pretty narrow. Um, there's places there you might have to build it out wider. Um, of course, it's, so it's not just as simple as you know slapping a new piece, sort of pavement on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, all of those need to be planned and you know and, and worked with with you know engineers presumably, um, you know and planned part of paving cycles. Um, so to propose that at fifty thousand again. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, I really think, yeah, we'll be in a great position to pay for the main street project. It will wipe out the 
mm-hmm. you obviously use the most. <laughs> Uh, the last one in the reserve lines, um, I'm sorry, second to last one, is the um, Harbor Reserve. So that's one, again, we started a couple years ago knowing that we're going to have a substantial amount of improvements that need to be done. The fish plant parking lot, spilings need to be replaced um, at the very least. Um, there is a couple of sections there where some of the old concrete slabs are laid on the top of the, in the parking lot that you, you know have a two or three foot void underneath them. Um, presumably needs to at least be looked at whether we can backfill it with shock, you know, some sort of filler or something. We do need to take a look. So it, could, it might be more than just the spilings. Um, of course, both bolt launches um, at the next to the hotel and, and then the one by the in that parking lot at, fish, at the fish plant um, need to be looked at and at the very least repaired, if not replaced in total. Um, so the thought of this a couple of years ago was to create a reserve line that could be a ship grant match when we get ready to do that. Um, so if you were to put another 50,000 in there with what's in there already, you'd be at about 230,000. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think that puts us in the ballpark of what we would have for a 50% match um, to certainly do the fish plant and hopefully both boat launches. Yeah. It doesn't, it would probably wouldn't cover any float replacements at that point, but also puts in position if a float goes, to, you know, goes, gets damaged, we, we have enough to be able to build it on hand without having to wait a year or that we did before. The the next one that's in there is the um, the fireworks committee, the reserve line that was created last year for the fireworks. Um, So I'll put it up on the screen. I don't know if it's... Just share it so the other members can see it if they have that. Um, so I mentioned at the last selectmen's meeting there was a correspondence from the committee to consider the funding again this year. Um, I think initially, you know, my recommendation in the budget committees has been not to fund the three grand um, for the fireworks for next year, but um, certainly the committee. Um, you know, made it known last year and certainly again this year that they are hoping for the town support and funding the three thousand um, dollars. We did commit to a contract that said we'd pay at least eight for this year, um, whether the show happens or not. If it doesn't happen on the fourth, you know, contract wise, I, I'll reach out to Julie and the company that we signed with, but to follow up on that. Um, but we did commit to the eight grand as a town. Um, you know, so there was at the very least, you know, that three thousand would presumably go towards make it, making that happen if it happens. Again, still lots of questions about at this point whether the July Fourth happens or not. So. And they plan to do it on a different date if it doesn't. So yeah, no, I think that's something we need to do. Yeah. Well, I think three thousand dollars for a nice thing. I know, and the, you know, it is something that makes people feel better. Right. I, I see nothing wrong with I that. I think we should probably probably need a little celebration and it's all over with. Yeah, and that's kind of what they're saying in their letter too. You know, given what's going on. So, yeah, I agree. All right. So with those changes, it does um, taking out the police cruiser amount does bring it down um, a little bit um, from the total. So it would be a. Yeah. Oh, old fire hall. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so that would bring it to 10,000 or 10.24% on that, on the capital reserve. So that's a good, um, you know, again, a good chunk of the overall budget, but um, you know, some of that increase that we'll, that we'll see at the end, you know, is due to that, that kind of that department. So just to get an idea. 4,500. The police cruiser actually wasn't proposed to be funded this year, so it, it, it's just um, so it's just a five. Yeah, four four hundred and thirty thousand five hundred for the capital reserves line. Jake and DW, do you have anything? Any questions on that? No, no I'm good. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, there's a moving second in. Uh, Eric Gasparini votes yes. Sam Ellen? Yes. Dick Thompson? 
Yes. Donald Poole? Donald Poole? Yes. Yes. Bill Parkman. Yeah. Motion carries 5-0. All right, how are you feeling? It's been an hour. You want to keep going? Well, you know, we don't have to. Um, especially because those that are tuning in, um, I want to hear, you know, an update on solution development. You know, does anyone else object to that stuff? So the donations lines, the planning and development line, the debt service line. Um, so again, some of that debt service might take on some dis more discussion. Um, the planning certainly has some discussion behind it. Um, donations and then whether or not you want to go back through once you see, you know, once the you looked at it initially, you know, potential to go back through um, and see if there's other things now. Um, again, certainly things are a little different at the moment. Um, so if you want to go back through, um, I have um, the donations. Oh, sorry, we have that one already. Um, planning and development and debt service. Mm -hmm. Lizzie, did you have others that we that you would track that we didn't get to yet? That's what I have. Mm -hmm. Those are the only three that I didn't have a final motion for was donations, planning and debt service. Okay. Um, We're in a position though. Obviously, town meeting is going to happen anytime soon anyway. Right. So we can stop for the night and come back to those final items. This does get a little tedious. So can I ask a question? Did you um, choose some while others are away for that brief time? You know, I don't know if you did. Because I, I have cemeteries not checked off. Did they get done, Lizzie? You wouldn't do anything without you, can that was looked at. <laughs> yeah, right there. I have it as looked at. Oh, okay. But I mean, pretty sure we approved that one already. Okay. Okay. I um, Luther had asked for um, five hundred dollars more, and we discussed working with the stroke study for the GIS mapping. And the final amount was fifty three thousand eight hundred and fifty. Okay. You might have done it without you. Yep, you did. Yep, thank you. Okay, so this one the reported numbers. And reported town reported numbers and reported town manager as well. So I'll, I'll let Andy uh, talk just for a minute and then the board can weigh in with their thoughts. Um so I'll just um just bring up I do want to bring up the, the banking RFP that we signed three years ago now is been three years and that's so that's up so the banking services um, is something that I just want to mention to you so we have an opportunity um, through the original RFP to have two additional one year kind of renewals um, I do still got to talk with them about whether the you know they've proposed the renewal but at a lower rate um, than what we what we had um, I don't know that you want to try and lock in a, a new three-year renewal right now given the climate um, you know, so if you wanted to do just a one year, I can still talk to Camden and see if, you know, look back at the documents to make sure that it shouldn't still be what it was, you know, but it looks like it could be, um, anywhere between the 1.25 we had and as low as 0.25 potentially. So, um, I would recommend if you were to do it, not to do a new three year at this time, right. but just do the one year and then look in a year from now to maybe go out further. The other option again, of course, is to put an RFP out. Um, for a longer period and see if the other banks could do better. Um, it's up to you right now. I mean, you can just wait until I'm just waiting. Yeah, but you know, for the time being, yeah, we shouldn't be too aggressive. You know, hopefully, you know, things will get better. Right. Um, I think I'd just go with the one year. Yeah. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Um, I mean, it never hurts to see what other banks are willing to offer, but I agree anything more than a year seems a little um, aggressive, I guess, at this point, since we don't know what's going to happen in the next 12 months. All right. Um, the other thing I just want to bring up, too, for you know, business like this is the whether or not you want to put the usually we wait till the late summer, early fall to put out a fuel bid. I don't know if now would be a time, you know, I've always thought it would be better to try and do it maybe, maybe before we lock in the and approve a budget so you actually know what the figure is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if at this point in time, 
Um, if you want to try and look at putting something out as an RFP for fuel bids for next year now, um, I know some places have, uh, towns on the mainland have, um, you know, so it's up to you. I don't know what the, you know, what the fuel companies that we have on the island, you know, you know what their ability is now to be able to put a bid together, but um, you want to try and explore that before the, you know, that might modify the numbers in the budget potentially. Um, right. You know, contract right now. So if you want, I can work out, work that up. If you approve, if you want me to do that, and you know, by the time next time we meet, we might be able to have even potentially some responses, mm -hmm. uh, depending on when we meet. Yeah, again. let's do that. Okay. Great. Um, other than that, I think those are what I asked you to remind me of. Um, that's been the majority. We do have um, another grant that we're working on. I did get a quick update on the garage and the bridge projects. Um, the engineers are you know, trying to finalize those RFP documents still. Um, and they're, they're working up kind of all the particulars for the garage. The, we did just send a letter um, to the Coast Guard, I think it was, for the permitting process for the bridge, given the engineers the ability to represent us um, in communicating with them. Um, so those are still moving along on their end. It's about three weeks behind what we thought it would be right now. So. I'm hoping that we still at the end of April now are going to be able to put those documents out. Um, so it'd be only a month behind, but um, keep pushing them to do that. Yeah. Everything's a little bit, you know, timelines are a little weird right now. So. Um, Never know. Um, so yeah, in terms of, um, for those that are still on that are waiting, there was the, the public health team did, you know, put out, uh, a, a more expanded update, you know, regarding the news yesterday, um, that was in the works all day. Um, so that did go out. Um, Phil did share some thoughts, uh, in kind of what he was hoping to see. I'm hopeful that the, what was posted and I did, um, for those, in the meeting room, print it out. I'll put it up on the screen so you guys are far. If you haven't seen it posted yet, um, you can see it. Um, grab it here. Bill, can you see it on your screen, Lizzie? Yes, uh, I've seen it anyway. Okay. Yeah, I can see it. Perfect. Um, so yeah, um, you know what we posted last night was acknowledging that there is uh, a resident that did. Um, test positive and they are being treated at a hospital. Beyond that, the public health team is a town entity. You know, we aren't able to go too much further. We certainly can't talk about who or anything like that as a town entity. Um, it's all con kind of confidential information. Um, so we're standing, you know, as a health team behind that and, and, you know, would certainly encourage, you know, that part of discussion not go further. Um, acknowledging for the community to know, you know, the big question, of course, today is what do we do now? Um, and I, I'm hoping that this this memo um, lays out, lays out that that you know the recommendations that have been been put out you know by this main CDC in the town for the last few weeks, um, the mailing that went out two weeks less than two weeks ago to everyone on the island, um, that's what we shared last night, echoing the things that people should be doing. You know they've been saying act as though it's here, um, so that when when someone asked at the public health teams um, Q and A that we did virtually, um, you wouldn't have to change what you're doing. That if everyone's following the guidelines and the orders from the governor, um, we're able to continue. You know, wear your mask when you're in public. Uh, wash your hands. Don't go out unless you have to. Um, some of this stuff is. We've had a lot of businesses call and say, "Should what should we change? How can we do things to protect the employees?" You know, and I think you know we've been able to talk to most of them. Most of them have. Most of the businesses have done things um, to protect the employees and the customers already. You know, by not letting customers in into the stores and, and taking the orders at the door or calling ahead, you know, a lot of them have done a really good job at, you know, making that effort to, to reduce that impact to their employees and protect the customers. So um, we try, we wanted to make sure that there was a letter that went out explaining what we could say legally um, in, in the, you know, to let people know what it is they should and could be doing. Um, so beyond that, you know, certainly anything that we want to hear or be able to present to people, we can follow up um, tomorrow or over the weekend with even more information that, you know, based on what the questions are. 
um, but we are we are have to be mindful of what it is we actually can say legally. The HIPAA uh, attachment that you sent us had that be made put out so everybody can read that. Sure. I thought that was helpful. Sure. Yep. Did you guys on the phone have a chance to read that? I just read through it. Okay. I just wanted I think, clarification. It says a Vinyl Haven resident. Can you put to bed the rumors that this person is not an actual resident? They came from out of state, traveled across the country, and then yeah, contracted it while they were here or on the, or en route? Yeah, I mean, that's not information that we're, we have the, you know, confirmation from the main CDC to give. That's, you know, that's part of the main CDC's contact uh, tracing process. Um, the best we know is it's someone who had resided on Vinyl Haven and is now being treated at a hospital. Were they here alone or were they here with a family? And if, if uh, they were here with a family, has that family been also been exposed and are they being tested? So again, those questions to be answered by the town of Vinyl Haven is not something that we feel we could do and still be in HIPAA compliance. So will the CDC be commenting on that? They have a process that we can explain further in an update tomorrow, which was part of, you know, part of a testing and uh, uh, tracing kind of update. So people are aware of kind of what, what the process is. Um, and so I think that's something that we can provide as, as well as this HIPAA information that Pam was mentioning parts of this update or parts of this document that was shared with you guys in your, in your packet. So um, I think we can provide at least the process behind how CDC handles that, um, you know, but that's not something that, um, you know, again, that the health team or the, or the board should be, should be answering directly. Okay. Why are we calling it a resident? Why can't we just say they reside on Lionel Even? Well, what do you consider a resident? Right. A resident is somebody is a year-round person, or is it a person that Main. is both in town in, on Vinyl Haven? I mean, what? Right. So what everyone's got a, everyone's got a different definition, right? Legal terms. You know, if you're with the IRS, it's where, who do you file? What state do you file your your taxes in, or say you reside in when you file taxes for for voting purposes? There's a whole other set of things, right? And so. Um, I don't know really where the clear, where the distinction needs to be made, um, other than to say there was someone residing on Vinyl Haven, they're being treated in a hospital now. Like, I think beyond that, I don't think it's right for us to go too much further down that road um, without without being in concern of violating HIPAA, HIPAA policies or laws. Yeah, I just think that that was the question that Donald was asking. Yeah. Also, you know, is the person a resident? How do you determine who is a resident and who isn't? So I right. think that's what it's a fair question, but not one that I feel that you should provide, you know, with the parameters that we know we need to stick to with the HIPAA laws. Right. Um, I, I think it's just important as well that the board, again, you know, as we have reminded people numerous times that if you are not here on the island right now, you do not need to be on the island right now. Yeah, if any of the board members do have other questions that you're hearing in regards to the, the follow up, you know, I know there's questions about treatment, uh, testing, um, and then this, this tracing. If there's other questions that you can think of between now and tomorrow morning, just give us a call or shoot me an email. And in terms of again, process and the follow up, we can look at including it in a, an update tomorrow that kind of lays out what the public health team kind of parameters and in, in what it does is, what the CDC will do. Um, you know, what we can and cannot say. Um, I mean, the biggest message that we want to put out, you know, with what Eric said is, again, there's guidelines that are put out there and just follow, follow them. There's orders that are out there from the governor. Please follow them. If we need to repost them, we can repost them. Um, but a lot of this stuff has been in place for a few weeks now, what the board said is weeks old now. So it's not different. The, the things don't change now, but maybe it's a sense of, okay, a reminder that we really do need to follow in these things. I've, I've, I've had a couple of people ask me, is there, is there any 
uh, fines or anything if you're not following the governor's recommendations, you know, of essential travel? Or is it just, um, you know, on your honor or whatever? So the, the executive orders from the governor do lay out enforceability. There's, a, I believe, a fine, a finable amount in there, as well as a potential jail time for those that aren't quarantining or for those that are in violation of some of the other, um, many other orders that have been put in place. All of those are enforceable by uh, either state police, county police, or local law enforcement. So um, that's something that the county would probably would be best to answer. Um, you know, that we, I know we've talked to the deputy, we've talked to the sheriff about it generally. I don't know if they've made an official statement gen, you know, about the orders. You know, I know they've made statements over the last month or so, um, but specifically with what Jake's asking, I don't know if they've issued any or how, you know, how, how aggressive they are on that. It's really hard to probably prove, and I doubt they're checking. I know they're not stopping every car like you might have seen in other places, but that's just the way um, it's, you know, it's being handled in Maine, so. Is this particular case gonna be investigated? As far as we know. Okay. That's what we were told. Um, can, I some, can I have some clarification? Am I allowed to return to the island or do I have to find another place to live? <laughs> Is it necessary? <laughs> uh, yes, because we sold the house we're staying in in Florida, so we don't have any other place to stay. So, so if it's necessary, right, that, that, that's, the, that's the extent that the governor's asked of people, you know, the travel you do should be necessary. Um, and so coming back to your home is certainly necessary. When you get here, the governor does have pretty strict orders. If you're traveling from out of state, you need to quarantine yep. for at least two weeks. The only at least two weeks, that, yes. The only other reason that you should even think of going out in that time is for essential needs. And so again, the medical center has been gracious enough um, throughout this to do, you know, deliveries for free for people. A lot of places are set up to do stuff curbside, obviously now. So, I mean, there's Certainly other ways that people, you know, even some, you know, Pam and Jake, when they got back, I'm sure they had people able to drop stuff up for them or something. So there's certainly ways this community gets pulled together to make all that happen. So you don't have to leave once you're here. Yeah, we're, we're making all the necessary, taking all the necessary steps and we're going to try to stock up so we can't, we won't have to leave. So well, yeah, yeah, the grocery, I'm, I'm aware of all those rules. Say when we got huh? back, the grocery store brought our groceries right to us so we didn't even have to you know leave the house so that was pretty good yeah how are they how are they doing keeping up with demand though i've heard it's been it's been tough it's tough on the workers i'm sure but as far as i'm concerned my orders are filled um pretty much with what i've needed you know okay yeah, we have, so we haven't had any trouble either we've had maybe one thing per order that they might not have but i mean we've only been ordering once a week so the orders have been pretty large so it's been pretty yeah. pretty steady okay good to hear you know and i also didn't need to mention you know this board and the community as a whole owes a huge debt of gratitude to the public health team you know mm -hmm. and for those tuning in that don't know who's on that board andy doyle town manager Dan desmond Gary McKee, Mark Candid, um, Gabe, uh, Gabe, Gabe McPhail, and uh, Jennifer and Tanya. Jennifer and Tanya. You know, they've done fantastic work, you know, during this crisis to keep the community informed and, you know, them, you know, our friends. All right, I agree. Uh, the only other thing that popped in my head today, corruption. Mm hmm um has any guidelines come down from the state about how we i'll need to check with darlene specifically on like the local elections the state elections of course have been for now postponed to june, uh, july 14th i believe um i assume that we're not going to host another election in june if, you know presumably we'll just look to do that when the state does theirs at this point but there's certainly there's plenty of guidelines generally out there about because other states have had elections during this um, for other things. And so we'll find out more specifically. I know the local elections, a couple open seats. And so we'll just, I can clarify and follow up with that. Maybe we can do that in one of our updates or just follow up with, a, with an email. I talked to Darlene about some of the guidelines that the state's putting out about distancing, like which booths on the wall we can use and keeping that six feet apart. Um, the state is also offering to provide 
like sanitizer, gloves, masks. Um, they just have to return a survey. Darlene has to return a survey. Um, also encouraging absentee voting, strongly encouraging absentee voting. Is there gonna be a way that we can get the absentee votes sent out to everyone? Will they just be delivered by mail or? I oh, yeah. so was working on that. Okay. I mean, some, some of them do them by mail now, though they can call in or have someone pick it up, you know, up to a certain point, you know, so I think we can certainly make all of that well known, like how you can go about getting those. If there's any changes, I mean, they're going to have to adjust between now and uh, presumably mid-May. I think, you got, I mean, there's so many days before the election, it has to be able to go out anyway. So we can certainly follow up um, you know, some, either with an update or, you know, officially or with just an email or an update at the board meeting next uh, with what we know. Is there any way that you could just email Darlene or someone like that and they could just send it, send it to you in the mail so you don't have to call? If, I mean, if that's something you know you want to do. Yeah, so we can, we'll, we'll follow up and see what the state's allowing and not allowing and, and let folks know how that's going to work. Does anyone else have anything to report on? In that case, I move we adjourn. Second. Tim Alley seconds the motion. Eric Gasparini votes yes. Tim Alley? Yes. Bill Crossman? Yes. Dave Thompson? Yes. Donald Cole? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Have a good evening. Thank you.